This very well might be my most requested video ever. I gotta watch the clouds as a storm moving in. Don't wanna get struck by lightning. So many people have asked me for my Sony A1 setup guide and that's what this video will be. I'm gonna show you exactly how I set up this camera, why I make the changes that I make. The A1 is a highly customizable camera. You can set it up dozens of ways to get great results. This is not the best way, it's not the worst way. It's the way that has helped me achieve amazing results time after time again. That's the whole idea here, is you want to be able to consistently capture amazing images, consistently capture amazing video. With that said, this is not a complete guide. I'm only going to show you how I set up the camera to shoot stills. I'm not, this has nothing to do with video. That would be the topic of another conversation, maybe somewhere down the road. This also can be used for every style of photography. You can use it for astrophotography, sports, of course wildlife, birds, portraits, landscapes anything with just a few minor changes to the camera, actually very, very few. And it's actually really powerful when you set it up this way. And it's also set up in a way to where you never have to remove your eye from the viewfinder. That's extremely important. You always wanna be focused on what's happening through the viewfinder. And we're gonna custom map all kinds of great functions and buttons to be right under our fingertips to make important changes right out in the field without ever having to take our eye off of the viewfinder. That's extremely important. Nobody is paying me to make this video. I'm doing this just because I know how much fun it is to be out there and do this stuff. And I hope you can get something out of this. Take this video as an outline, apply it to yourself. Um, I'm not a Sony ambassador. Sony has not endorsed me. They didn't pay me to do this. Um, with that said, I do have a downloadable PDF version of this video that you can buy on my website. There'll be a link in the description and up here on the screen. That's a great way to support me and what I do. And plus it's a PDF you can take with you everywhere to reference whenever you need it. So with all that said, let's jump right in. All right, first and foremost, let's start at the very beginning and go over all the buttons and knobs on the top of the camera. There's quite a bit of them and there's a little bit of dust or dirt. Actually, it's sand. I shoot out the beach, at the beach all the time, so my camera's a little dirty. Um, the most important thing right now is we want the camera to be in AFC mode. See this little hash mark, how it's lined up with the letters AFC, that's autofocus continuous. To change this, you press in this button right here where my thumb is, and then you rotate the dial. This changes the focus modes on the camera. We're gonna put it in AFC, and I'm never gonna change that, ever. It stays there forever. There's no need to change it with this setup. Um, then we're gonna change the speed at which the camera shoots. I like high plus, where it's lined up with this little hash mark. This is the fastest way the camera shoots in a burst at 30 frames per second. You can rotate the dial. You gotta push in this little button on the top and then you can rotate it to change this setting as well. I keep it on high plus. And on the other side, we've got some other buttons. This is the exposure compensation dial and it has a handy little lock here. You can press in this button to unlock it and then the dial moves and then press in the button to lock it if you need to. You have the dials on the front and the rear, shutter and aperture, and you can swap those however you want. And you've got this uh, rocker on and off switch here. It's like a hard rocker, probably likes a lot of ACDC. No, I'm joking. Um, and then you have the shutter button here you have pressed the shutter to focus and then it will take a picture, but we're gonna remove the ability to focus from that button and we're gonna put it on this back button here um, and we're gonna do some back button focus. There's some times when you wanna be able to do this. And then there's the C1 and C2 button. We're gonna custom map those to some great features. The whole idea is you never wanna take your eye away from this viewfinder. You wanna be able to make changes without doing that. Um, and then we're gonna be shooting in manual. Um, you have to actually press in this button and then you rotate this dial to get to the different modes. And this one is, we're gonna shoot manual the whole time. All right, let's take a look at the buttons on the back of the camera. And first, let's check out the screen. You can actually pull the screen away from the body and pivot it up for different styles of shooting. You push it back down against the body, but this is a pretty cool little trick that a lot of people don't know about. If you're using this camera and you're working in the menu or you're trying to review images, this little sensor here that activates the EVF also deactivates the rear screen. And every time you put your hand in front of it, it shuts the screen off. It can be kind of annoying. But there's a really easy way to fix that. Just pull the screen away from the body of the camera and it deactivates that little sensor. So now your hand can get in the way and it doesn't turn off the rear screen. Really handy little tool. Um, on the left, I'm gonna start with the C3 button. We can customize this. I don't use this button much at all. By default, you can use it to key or favorite an image so that you can't delete it from the card within the camera. 
Um, it's pretty handy. The next button is the menu that will activate the menu. Then you've got this big red record button that will record video. I deactivate that. I don't want to record video with that. I like to use the shutter button to record video. Then you have the big AF on button. That's going to be our primary mode of focus in this camera. We're going to deactivate focus from the shutter button and put it on this back button here and do some back button focus with the AF on button. And then we're going to set up another custom function to the button next to that, the AEL button. Um, it's a very powerful tool. And then you have this joystick here and it, it serves a, a couple uh, uh, functions here. You can use it to um, move your focal points around the rear screen or the EVF if you want. It zips around really, really quickly. <laughs> um, and that little joystick is handy for that. But what if you wanted to recenter your uh, focal point? Um, see how it's off center? You just press in this joystick, press it in, boom, double click it, and you're right in there, and it recenters it that way. Um, and then you have the can uh, the FN button here, the FN button. I actually don't use this button at all, the, the function menu. I'm going to map everything I need to a different button, so I don't actually use this uh, FN button at all. Um, but there's some handy stuff there if you want to customize that. I don't. Um, and then this is probably the most used button on the entire camera for me, and that would be the control wheel on the back. You can rotate it to the right or to the left, and it has different functions depending on where you are in the camera. If you're shooting, you can assign it to something custom. If you want to review your images, you can rotate it to the right to review images, rotate it to the left to review images, and quickly navigate certain things within the camera. Um, it's really handy. We're going to be setting that up to a custom function a little later. The playback button will allow you to review your images and then the garbage can is a, the way that you want to delete images. I'm not going to delete these because I like these pictures of this owl. Bard owls are really cool. Um, so um, we're going to actually also set this button to enable and disable the touch function operation of the camera. All right, this card has two card slots. I got the door open here on the side of the camera and you can see slot one and slot two. Actually pretty interesting form factor because it takes two different types of cards. I'm using the little CF Express type A cards. They're one of the prerequisites to shooting 30 frames per second. They're pretty pricey little cards, but you got to have them if you want to shoot this camera at full speed. You can also use SD cards in the same slot. Um, you just won't be able to unlock that faster speed and card slot number two is the same. I have the same type of card in there. And again, you can use another, um, you can use SD cards in there as well. Let's take a closer look at the A1 menu system and how you can navigate or move around this menu. When uh, Sony created the A7S III, they created a new menu system and they've adopted that same menu system on the A1. All of the main categories live over here on the left, um, starting with this shooting menu on, uh, and then under that is exposure and color. Under that is focus. Under that is playback, under that is network, and then next is setup. They all have their own individual colors and icons to help you know where you are at all times. And let's not forget this top one here, my menu. This is a custom menu system that you can populate with whatever you want. Um, it's pretty handy, but we're gonna be changing most of our stuff and assigning it to actual buttons. So let's see how the menu actually flows. It flows from left to right, column to column. So we're in shooting. We're gonna move over to the next column just by pressing right on the control wheel. I'm gonna select media, and I'm gonna go over one more by pressing right on the control wheel. I don't wanna format my card, but let's come down here and look at record media settings and just go one more to the right. And you can see all of the settings here that can be uh, customized. This is how the camera would record media. And you can see up top, we're in shooting media, record media settings. I'm gonna go ahead and press the menu button, and it's just gonna back me back up into the menu system. Um, there are a couple ways you can navigate the menu system. The entire screen by default is touch screen, but I actually remove the touch screen functionality because inadvertently I'll hit it with my nose when I'm shooting. And when I do, um, it tries to focus in the area where my nose was. So I've turned that off. Um, and I like to use the control wheel to actually navigate or move around um, this menu system. And again, it moves from left to right. It's pretty easy to navigate. It's very intuitive. Um, and it's a welcome change by everyone shooting the Sony cameras. All right, now that we understand how this menu system works, let's go ahead and go in here and make our first change. We're gonna make a change that so when you power this camera off, the shutter comes down 
and actually covers the sensor. This will prevent dust and dirt from sticking to the sensor. It's actually a cool little feature. And to do that, we have to come all the way down here to the bottom setup menu, this mustard colored menu. And then we're gonna come all the way down to the bottom again. So we're just gonna scroll down through all of these options down to number 12. And then we're gonna go to the right to this anti-dust function. And we're gonna select that. Um, and when you come to the right, you're gonna give uh, a couple of choices here. But you wanna, this bottom one, you want this to say shutter when power off. You want that on. And as soon as you select that, you get this little message. Do not leave the device exposed to strong light sources such as sunlight. Don't touch the shutter. That might damage the shutter. They're warning you. So, okay, we hit okay. So now what we've done is when we power off the camera, the shutter will close down over the sensor just like that. But like they said, don't stick your finger in there. Don't touch that. You could damage it. It's very, very fragile. Um, and here's something interesting. The way we have it currently set up, this will only affect if we are shooting in mechanical shutter. If you're shooting this camera silently um, in electronic shutter, the shutter would still stay open. So we need to make another change in addition to what we just did so that when you're shooting silently um, with electronic shutter, it will close that down over the sensor. So we're gonna come up here um, in the shooting menu and we're gonna go to the right and we're gonna come down to the shutter silent selection. And then we're gonna go to the right to silent mode settings. And then we're gonna come down to this target function settings and we're gonna go to the right. And we're gonna make a change here where it says shutter when power off. You want this to say not target. So go ahead and select not target and hit enter. Um, and then we're gonna back up into the menu system. So now if you're shooting electronic shutter silent and you turn the camera off, it will actually close the um, shutter over the sensor. If you need to access the sensor for any reason, you can just reverse these two settings and then you know have access to the sensor. Um, so let's move on. All right, now that we know how to actually make some changes in the menu, we're gonna go in and just start at the top and start making changes. And I'm gonna explain what I'm doing as I go. Um, so the very first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here to the shooting menu to image quality, and I'm gonna change the image quality settings. So I'm gonna just move to the right. Um, I'm gonna come up here to image quality settings. I'm gonna go to the right again. And you have a lot of options here. So file format, I like to shoot raw. You have a choice of raw, raw and JPEG or JPEG. Again, I like to shoot the raw file. And then you can choose the raw file type. You have three choices, uncompressed, lossless compressed, or compressed. I have shot raw compressed. It's one of the prerequisites to get the 30 frames per second. I haven't noticed any difference, but I'm not really a pixel peeper, so um, your results might vary. But if you want 30 frames per second, you're gonna have to choose this raw compressed. Um, I'm gonna come down while we're here. We're gonna go ahead to this record media settings while we're here, because it's conveniently right here in front of us. I'm gonna click on that. We're gonna make some changes here as well. Um, this is where you can actually tell the camera where do you want to record specific types of media. You can have images and video go to different cards if you want to, but I have them both going to um, cards in the slot one. Um, I'll just find the videos and images separately. It, it doesn't bother me. I'm not trying to separate them. And then you wanna do this um, next setting down here Auto switch media, this is very, very important. Make sure that you have that turned to on. This will automatically switch from one card to the next when you fill one card. If you didn't have this on and you filled card one, it would say card empty and it would want you to swap the card out. So with auto switch media, it will automatically switch to card two even if you're in the middle of a burst. Um, very important, especially because this camera is so fast, make sure you have that auto switch media set to on. Okay, I make no other changes to any of the other menu selections here. So we're gonna go ahead and go back a little bit and start making some other changes in other places in the menu. So we're gonna come down here to file. Um, I don't actually use this, but it's handy if you want to. You can come down here to the copyright info and if you come over, it'll you can tell it to embed copyright info in the metadata of the image. You can set the photographer, the copyright date, copyright wording, all that good stuff. I don't actually do it, but that's where you would if you want. I don't do anything in the shooting mode here. 
In the drive mode, we're going to come over to the right to the continuous shooting speed. We're going to come to the right again, and we're going to select high E shutter. And notice it says 20 images per second. Um, we're going to do some changes that will actually make it do 30 frames per second, even though it still says 20 uh, images per second. So we're going to make those changes a, a little later in the menu. And I've timed it. You get 30 images per second just to make sure you um, have that set. We already did that actually on a dial anyways. Um, down here under the silent shutter mode settings, we've already made some changes over here into the silent mode settings. Um, but make sure you have silent mode on and then the camera won't make a sound at all when you're shooting. It's awesome. Nobody knows you're taking a picture. Really handy. Um, I like to change these two, release without lens and release without card, to disable. This is just basically telling the camera to not take a picture if there is no card and to not take a picture if there is no lens attached. So let's go ahead and move back out of here and we're gonna go back to the left to the image stabilization section. This is all default. I make no changes here at all. I'm gonna come down to the next portion of the menu. The zoom section, I don't actually do anything here either. And the shooting display, this is just a personal preference. I like to have the grid line display on, and I like the rule of thirds grid to be overlaid on top of my screen or my EVF, just in case I'm trying to do a composition. It's, it's handy to see that rule of third grid. And that's it in the shooting menu. All right, let's move to the next portion of the menu that we're gonna be changing, and we're gonna be in exposure. And I'm not gonna change anything in the exposure or the ISO settings. Um, and the next setting, exposure compensation, I don't make any changes here. In metering, I'm just gonna come make one quick change to the spot metering point. I don't actually shoot with spot metering uh, very often, but if I do, I want to change this to focus point link. That way, if I'm metering, spot metering, it will meter the light inside the focus point only. Again, I don't use it th that often, um, but it's good to have there in case I wanna go and spot meter something. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to the left. I don't actually do anything here in flash because I'm not using a flash. The white balance, I'm not changing anything here either. Color and tone, we're gonna make some changes here. I'm gonna go over to the right. I turn off this D-range optimizer that turned that to off. And I use a creative look of standard and I make a few changes to the standard picture profile. So I come over here, contrast is at zero. Um, the next highlights are zero. Shadows are at zero. Fade is at zero. Saturation is zero. Sharpness I have set at four. Sharpness range I have set at three. And clarity I have set at four. So I'm using a standard picture profile with a few changes. This will actually those changes will only appear in the thumbnail when I'm reviewing the image on the back of the camera or in the EVF, but it will also make those changes to any video that I take because I'm shooting video in standard. If I'm shooting video, I'm using the standard profile just like I have from stills. So all of those settings are baked into the video. You might not want that. You might want to shoot in one of the log modes where you have more room to make adjustments and color grade, but I have found that the color um, and everything set up like I have it right out of this camera is pretty much perfect. In fact, I've done some really amazing sunrises with this camera that are just, they're just mind blowing how good they are. Maybe I'll overlay one here while I'm talking. Um, and in those sunrises, it's, this is right out of camera. They just look fantastic. And some of the people that I've run into thought that, you know, I spent hours color grading that footage. I didn't, that's right out of the camera. So these picture profiles, you can change them to your taste. Um, how I have this set up again is how I like to shoot stuff. And it doesn't affect the actual raw file on the image, but it does bake that setting into the video that you might be shooting later. Under picture profile, I don't make any changes. I actually have it turned off because I'm not using that feature. And the next feature that we're gonna make a change to is zebra display. This is extremely important and let me explain why. So zebras will show you live an area of the image or video that is overexposed or underexposed. So you can make changes very quickly based on this live feedback. It's extremely powerful. And once you get used to shooting this way, you'll never wanna shoot any other way. And you'll find that all of your pictures and videos are pretty much perfectly exposed. All right, let me show you how to properly set up the zebras on this camera. So you're gonna move over to the right. You're gonna wanna make sure zebra display is on so that we can see these zebras. And then you're gonna change the zebra level. By default, it's gonna be up here when you come into this. It's gonna be at 70. You're gonna wanna scroll all the way down to the bottom 
to C2, and you want the values to say lower limits and 107 plus. Now, I didn't come up with this information. Ryan Mintz did, a fellow YouTuber. Go check out his channel and subscribe because he's got some great content. And let me show you how this actually works in the real world. All right, here's a good example of the zebras actually happening. This image is massively overexposed and luckily I've got this snowy owl that just hangs out in this tree right in my backyard in Florida. One of the rarest things ever. You know, of course I'm kidding. But you can see the zebra display on this bird, on the white part of the bird. That's telling me that the image is overexposed. I'm losing data there. So I'm gonna make a quick adjustment. Um, I'm just gonna lower my exposure by altering my ISO until those zebras are gone. And now my image is perfectly exposed. Again, if it was too dark, I could raise my exposure. Oh, that's got the zebras coming back. Um, that's still okay. That little bit of zebra is tolerable because the dynamic range on this camera is good. But typically, I wanna see no zebras like that and then it is perfect. I love shooting with zebras. I'll never do it any other way. Um, it is such a game changer for me and I'll give you a really good example of how I was using this and how it saved me. And this is what sold me on it. I was filming a cormorant, a blackbird, in black water in the shadow of a bridge. So it was very, very dark area. So I had settings up. Um, my ISO was pretty high to get a good exposure on this bird. Right when I was filming this bird, a roseate spoonbill flew by in perfect light with like a 30 or 40 foot piece of grass. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I immediately turned my camera to the sky and the, the entire viewfinder was zebraed out. It's because of the way I have this camera set up, I quickly made a change to my ISO and about half of a second I had the exposure perfect and I was able to capture the image of that spoonbill. Again, it's about being able to get that data quickly from the sensor into the EVF to your eye, to your brain, and then making changes very quickly based on that again. Also, without ever taking your eye off of the viewfinder. If I had to take my eye from the viewfinder and dive into a menu to make those changes, it was like two seconds that it happened. I would have completely missed it. So again, it's about being able to use these features quickly without removing your eye from the viewfinder. Okay, let's jump into the autofocus menu system and make some changes in here. Um, the first place we're gonna move to is over here on the far right. We're gonna come into priority set and AFC and we want that to be set on release. Any other setting and you won't be getting the 30 frames per second. So I wanna shoot at 30 frames per second so I'm gonna keep this on release. That's again one of the prerequisites for getting that speed. The next thing, and it's very, very important, is this AF tracking sensitivity. You have um, selections from one to five, one being locked on and five being responsive. AF tracking sensitivity seems to vary greatly based on the environment that you're shooting in and the lens that you're using. Um, so it's very important. We're gonna actually map that to a custom button so that we can change that very quickly without ever removing our eye from the viewfinder. So basically what this is telling the camera to do is how quickly do you want it to jump from one subject to another within the frame of your camera. So if there's a, a tree right here and a bird goes flying behind the tree, do you want the camera to keep focus on the bird the entire time and ignore the tree? Or do you want it to, when the bird gets behind the tree, to move focus to the tree and then move focus back to the bird? You would think you'd want it to be on the bird at all times, so that would be one lock. It would stay on and it would ignore the tree and it would keep the focus on the bird when it came out the other side. But I found there's many instances where you want it on five or responsive so that it jumps very quickly to the tree and then very quickly back to the bird. This is especially true if you're shooting around water. You don't want the camera to lock onto a wave or some ripples and keep, onto the, keep locked onto that and not your subject. Um, sometimes a setting of five or responsive will allow the camera to maybe hit the wave on one frame and then move back to your subject on the others. This is the same in a very busy background. If you're trying to focus on a subject that's blending in with the background, it's gonna be very, very challenging for the camera to tell the difference between your subject and the background play with this setting, the AF tracking sensitivity. Um, there is no set way for it. Again, it's something I change up a lot depending on where I am and, and how the focus system is acting. If it's acting erratic and jumping around, then I'll make a change to try to slow it down or speed it up one way or the other. Back in the autofocus menu and we're gonna make another change. We're gonna change this AF with shutter to off. This will disengage the autofocus from the shutter button and we're gonna use back button focus and here's why. 
Back button focus, it's a topic of debate, especially with these new mirrorless cameras, getting a nice little afternoon rain shower. Eh, hopefully it's just rain. <laughs> I still like to use back button focus because there are times when you don't want the camera to acquire focus. And when you have um, the focus on the shutter button, it will always try to acquire focus when you have pressed the shutter. There are times it's very important when it should not be acquiring focus. I go into more detail about some of those and give you some good examples of those in the downloadable PDF. Again, it's a like good companion to this video. There are two ways that you can do this. You can control the focus of the camera. That is. There are two ways that you can control the focus. You can use back button focus. So if you're holding in that back button, the camera is always continuously trying to focus. If you remove your thumb from that back button, you're no longer focusing, the plane is locked. You can also program a manual focus mode to a button and we're gonna do that as well. So we're gonna have back button focus and we're gonna have another button that will manually focus so that we can do some other cool tricks to make sure everything is working the way that it should. Again, we're gonna be removing the focus ability from the shutter button. It will only take a picture. You're gonna use a button on the back, the AF on button, to acquire focus. So you can press that button, it's focusing, let go, it's not focusing. Press that button, it's focused, let go, it's not focusing. Because there are some very important times when you do not want the camera to focus. Let's jump back into the autofocus menu and make another change. We're gonna change this pre-AF to off. We don't want the camera to pre-focus on anything. Um, and then we're gonna move back in the menu system to the left because we're done in that area. And we're gonna come over here to the focus area. This is where you would change your default focus area, the top here, but we're actually gonna assign a button to do that later. So I'm not gonna make any changes here but I am gonna come down to this focus area limit because we're gonna limit some of the focus areas that we can actually use here. So I'm gonna go ahead and come down here and select focus area limit, and then I'm gonna move over to the right. And by default, there's 14 focus areas, but I only need four. I've only really ever had a need for these, no more. Um, so I've removed the rest, and the ones that I like to use are zone, and then tracking zone underneath that, and then two over, tracking spot small, and then two over, tracking spot large. And I'm gonna have a button that will allow me to cycle through all of these um, very, very quickly. So I don't have to take my eye from the viewfinder. Just remember that it's very important to not lose sight of your subject. And by being able to change the focus area quickly with a button press, I don't do that. I can, I can keep my eye on the subject at all times. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and select okay. And then I'll have just these four focus areas available for a custom button. All right, let's check out the focus areas. Remember, we've put four on here and only four. And the one that I have on right now is zone and its perimeter are these little white squares. They might not be showing up on the screen, but zone is about right here and it's gonna attempt to focus anywhere within those squares. I can move the squares around and now it's here. I can move them up and now it's here. And if I press the AF on button, it's gonna attempt to focus on something in that area and you can see where these green clusters of squares are. It's focusing on this part of the tree branch, right? But I don't want that. I want it to focus on the bird. I'm gonna move over to the bird and then press the AF on button. And now you can see those little clusters dancing all over the bird's face. It's focusing on the bird's face. It's not focusing on the eye because I've disabled the bird eye AF. I'll turn it on really quick. Um, and it has already painted a square around this eye. It's gray. So if I press the AF on button now, it's automatically locking focus on this eye and it jumped to the other one right then. So it's locking focus on the eye automatically, even if the square isn't, the focus area isn't necessarily directly on the subject. It's still finding that eye and, and keeping that bird's eye in focus. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that back off just to prevent any confusion. And I'm gonna switch to the next focus area just by pressing the C2 button. And it'll say down here, I am now in focus area zone tracking. So zone tracking is just like zone, but it also has a tracking spot. If I press the green, um, press the AF on button, it will paint a green square on my subject. And that green square will stay or stick to the subject regardless of where it moves through the frame. It will track it. Super, super powerful. If it loses tracking, it automatically defaults back to that cluster of zone. So it's like two focus, fo fo two focus systems in one. If you have the bird eye AF on, it's like three. It's gonna to try to find the bird eye. If it can't find the bird eye, then it's gonna to move to um, that tracking box. If it can't get the tracking box, then it's gonna do the cluster like that we saw earlier. Super, super powerful and it rarely ever misses. But what if you wanted to pinpoint where it's actually focusing even smaller? 
you can press the C2 button again and now we've got this tracking spot small and I can put that spot right on the bird's nose if I want and then hit the button and because I still have the IAF it's locking onto his eye so I'm going to disable that and I'm going to put the tracking spot right on his nose you see how or his beak and it's it will then track the beak wherever it went throughout the frame sometimes if you were using a bigger focus area like zone tracking it might not grab the area of the bird that you want. It might grab like his shoulder, it might grab his cheek. Suppose you wanted to grab his beak instead. So you can switch to a smaller one and look, boom, you've got it to control or to lock focus on the bird's beak. If I press the C2 button one more time, I now have a tracking spot that's a little bit bigger. It allows me to maybe pick and choose a little bit more where I want that focus area or where I want the focus to go. If I press the AF on button, it locks right onto the area right underneath the square. So you can really pinpoint where it's focusing. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the bird eye back on and switch back out. Um, we're back into zone and you can see it's locking that bird's eye all the time. And you just cycle through these very quickly by pressing the C2 button. Never have to take your eye away from the viewfinder. It's very, very important. All right, we're going to make another change in the autofocus menu. We're going to come down here to the focus area color, and I change it to white. Um, and this is what it looks like. The focus area boundary, these four little corners that my finger keeps covering, that's the focus area color that we just changed. It's white. The green line in the middle, that's my um, level. So the camera's level. Yay. It's doing its job. But by default, I believe this is red. I didn't like red. Red, for some reason, made me think there was something wrong. So I changed it to white. I don't do... I don't change anything else in any of these menus here or any of the menus down here. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the left and we're gonna come in here to face eye AF. This is important stuff here. And we want face eye priority and autofocus to be on. This will prioritize the eye or the face um, when you're trying to focus on something. And the face eye subject, I have it set at bird because I mostly photograph birds, but this is pretty interesting. The next setting here, subject select, setting will allow us to cycle through all of these if we want when we um, apply it to a custom button. And that's what it's telling you here. It narrows down the subject to be switched when face eye subject select is performed on the custom button. That's exactly what we're going to do a little bit later. So how it would work would be if for some reason you didn't photograph birds or you didn't photograph animals, you could remove those from being selected with that custom button, which wouldn't really make sense because then you would be left with just humans. I mean, there's only three of these. So I come and I turn them all on and we're going to set a button later that will allow us to cycle through them. So once it's done, you can press it once and you move from human. And then if you press it again, it moves to animal. You press it again, it moves to bird and so on and so forth. Again, you don't have to take your eye from the viewfinder to do this. I'm going to hit OK and we're going to move back out of the menu. I don't do anything here. Um, I don't mostly photograph people, so that's what that would be for. I don't have any need for those things there. So we're going to go back to the left and we're going to come into this focus assistance and make sure you have auto magnifier and manual focus on. This is a really cool little trick that it's going to transform our camera into a really powerful spotting scope. And we're going to do that here with the peaking display. But let me go ahead and show you how this works and then we'll come back and set it all up. And I've made some changes in here just so that we can see the peaking effect better. I've changed it to red and I've changed it to the maximum peaking level just so that we can see it here in this example. If you hold in the AEL button, you see all of that red area. That's where the camera is currently focused. So you can quickly see, oh, this whole tree and the bird are both in focus. That's pretty awesome. If I wanted to do the spotting scope, like I told you earlier, you can hold the AEL button and then just very lightly turn the focus ring and it zooms in massively um, to get a real close view and look you can really fine tune where you're focused or you can use it as a spotting scope. In this instance I've zoomed in really really far. It zoomed in far on the tree because that's the, uh, the center of the focus there. So if I just press the AEL button and barely touch the focus ring it activates focus peaking and when you touch the focus ring it magnifies the entire frame big time. So let's do this really quick while I got you here. Let's move this guy to the center so you can see that working on him. So I'm going to acquire focus on him. It locked onto the eye. I'm going to press the AEL button just to take a closer look and now you can see the eye and you can see the focus peaking moving across the um, bird's eye there very very faintly. 
but it, it'll get enough to see what's going on. Or like I said, you could use this as a spotting scope and spot animals, birds, really, really far away and see what they are and just let go and you're back to autofocus. All right, in order to get that to work, we need to make some changes in the peaking display. First of all, peaking display needs to be on. And then the peaking level, I like mid. You have three choices. You have high, mid, and low. High is a little too much. Low is not enough. And mid, it's just right. Just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Just right. And then peaking color, I've chosen yellow. Yellow seems to work best in the environment where I am mostly shooting, but you could choose red, blue, or white. Yellow obviously wouldn't be the right choice if you don't see the color yellow. It obviously wouldn't be the right choice if you're shooting fall leaves in Colorado because they are yellow and you needed to manual focus. You wouldn't be able to tell where the focus peaking was. So change it to a color that fits your environment and a color that's good to your eye. And that's it for the autofocus menu. Um, we're going to start tying all this stuff up here with some custom buttons. We've got to make a few more changes. If by chance you wanted to switch the card that you were viewing the media from, like your images or pictures, you wanted to move from slot one to slot two, you would do that here at playback target, select playback media. You can choose slot one or slot two and view the stuff that's on those. Oh, hey, I forgot about these guys. Really cool barred owls. I love these owls. Let's just go back. <laughs> we're going to come into the actual playback option here. And I'm going to um, set display as group on. And this is a really powerful feature. Let me show you what it does. All right, you can tell this awesome barred owl is part of a group of images because it looks like it's a pile of images, you know, stacked on top of each other. You got this little cool graphic showing you that. And if you wanted to actually view images within this group, you just press the button in the middle of the control wheel and it breaks the group into individuals. And then you can rotate the control wheel like I'm doing here to rotate and view all of them. You can't really see it changing that much because the owl wasn't moving when I took these photos. If I want I go back to group again, I press the center of the control wheel. If I press up on the control wheel, the disc button, I get this nice overlay that shows me everything that's happening with the camera, but it also shows me the settings I used when I took the shot or this group of shots. And if I press the center button again, I can break it apart and I see the settings for each one. And up top it says this is picture one of six. I can cycle really quickly through them this way and see them all in the group and keep that burst together. Well, this is a good example of how the bird IAF works. That little green square is how the camera focused on this and it focused right on this barred owl's eye. How cool is that? And again, I've hit the center button and I'm back into the group. And you can actually delete an entire burst or an entire group right off of the card here. You just select delete all in this group, but be careful doing this just because remember, it's gonna delete every single image in that little group um, and you can't get it back. So be very careful if you're gonna delete like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and make another change in the um, playback menu. This focus frame display, I like to have this set to on, and what this does is it actually overlays the focus frame um, of where it actually focused or the actual focal point where it focused on the image. So in this instance, it focused on the owl's eye and that's indicated by that green square there. If it had focused on his chest, there'd be a green square on its chest. I really like having the focus frame show up on the EVF or on the back of the camera. It's a quick way to help troubleshoot if you have trouble out in the field. If you happen to review the image and you see the focus area is not on your subject and, it's, and your subject is not in focus, well, you know that either you didn't put your focus area on the camera or the camera missed your subject and focused somewhere else. All right, we're done with the playback portion of the menu. So we're gonna go ahead and jump over to the left and come into the network portion. And I only make one change here. And I put it in airplane mode, which basically disconnects all network connectivity. And let me explain why. I like to put the camera in airplane mode for two reasons. One, it saves power. I'm not using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connectivity unless I need to. And two, um, when I was teaching a workshop in Washington, I had a client tell me that thieves have gotten smart enough to use a phone, like a device like their phone or a laptop or an iPad, to search for Bluetooth signals when they're looking for things to steal. I don't know if this affects the Sony stuff, the Sony cameras, but a lot of devices, if you have a Bluetooth signal constant, a thief can come by like your car, if it was in the car, and they can kind of scan the car for a Bluetooth signal and it'll show up and go, oh look, there's a Sony A1 in the back seat. Let's smash the window and take it. Again, I don't know if this affects Sony cameras, but I know it affects some devices. So I just generally turn the Bluetooth or put it on airplane mode, which disables Bluetooth. 
If I need to use Bluetooth, I'll just turn it back on in the menu system. It's pretty easy to do. All right, we're done with the network section. So it's time to actually move down into the setup menu. And we're gonna start to customize this camera and really unlock all of the settings that we've done. We're gonna start mapping them to custom buttons. And to do that, you come down to this operation customize. And notice the selections on the right. You have three custom key setting options here. Each one uh, is referring to a specific portion or mode of the camera. So the top one is custom keys for images, custom keys for videos, and then custom keys for playback. You can basically have a different set of custom keys for each video mode or each camera mode. I only uh, make changes in the custom key setting for images. And then by default, the camera will just follow the custom settings from that mode of shooting. But like, like I said, you can have independent settings from one mode to the next. But let's go ahead in here and go to the custom key setting. And I've noticed when uh, I've showed a lot of people this um, via Zoom calls, they get a little confused. So what happens when you hit that custom key setting is you get another menu, another sub menu, and it's left justified as well. And you have four choices. This is rear one, which refers to the rear of the camera. And the next would be rear two, which refers to a close up where all these little buttons and knobs are. And the next is the top, which refers to all the stuff on the top. And then the final one is the lens, which you have one button on the lens that you can program. Um, so let's go in and make our first change. And again, this might be confusing to some. When you come in here and make a selection, you're actually gonna be pushed into another menu. Um, and we're gonna make this control wheel do something really awesome. This is one of my favorite features. So when you go ahead and hit the uh, center button of the control wheel, you're pushed into another menu. And these are basically all of the things that you can assign to that control wheel. If you look over to the left, it's like a mini menu. You have focus area, you have some customizing stuff, which is actually only one option, not set. And then you have some exposure options that you can put on that control wheel. I like to put the ISO on here. And for me, this is a game changer. And let me show you why. Oh, look, my snowy owl friend is back. Perfect way for me to show you how the ISO on the wheel is really, really helpful. So this image is actually underexposed. If I want to raise my exposure by adjusting the ISO or making the ISO higher or make the image brighter. I just turn the wheel to the right until I see zebras and then I come back down to the left until they're gone. Perfect exposure. So I'm just adjusting the ISO by doing that. I've anchored my shutter speed and my aperture to where I want them and then I can make my picture brighter or darker, overexposed or underexposed by simply rotating this dial very quickly. And if you want to shoot auto ISO, you just rotate the dial all the way to the left and it kicks in auto ISO, boom, there we go. I'm back in auto ISO. I like to shoot full manual with manual ISO. So if I turn the wheel to the right, I'm back into manual ISO again. I wanna see those zebras and then I back them down until they're almost gone. Perfect exposure on that awesome little cooperative snowy owl. All right, let's move back into the customizing menu and start uh, mapping and configuring more buttons. Um, the next one that we're gonna do is the AEL button, which is just to the right here. You can see it on the screen. And we're gonna make that an AF MF selector hold. So what that does is basically when you're holding the AEL button, you're in manual focus and it will activate focus peaking so you can see the exact plane of focus. And if you wanted to manual focus, like if you had some birds that were in grass, you could hold the AEL button in and then rotate the focus ring on the uh, barrel of the lens and it would manually focus, but you get to see exactly where it's focused because we have that focus peaking enabled. And you do that um, in the menu system over here. Let's go ahead and select this and move in. And it's in the autofocus section um, right here. And then you select AM, MF, select or hold. And that will allow you to, as long as you're holding in the AEL button, you're in manual focus and we let go, you're back in autofocus. I believe number three is default already set to AF on. I didn't make this change. I don't do anything with number four. That's the little movie record button. I've actually disabled that. I don't do anything with number five because it's a little too far away for me to reach. I'm usually, my left hand is usually holding the barrel of my lens. Um, so I don't typically use number five. Number six is the actual little garbage or rubbish can icon. I have that set to touch operation select. So if I'm shooting and I press the garbage can, I can get touch operation so I can touch the screen to focus. But again, I typically turn that off because I don't want to hit it with my nose. So I use the garbage can to turn that feature off. And I think that's a default setting as well. So we're gonna come back in. 
We're done with um, that portion of the custom menu. We're gonna come down to the next, which is all these buttons on the back. Um, within the control wheel, you know, there's four quadrants that you can set. Uh, the first one is the little joystick. I haven't done anything to that. That's a default setting. The second would be the, the enter button or the button in the middle of the control wheel. I actually deactivate anything from that because I use it for an enter selection. And then the left quadrant I have set to my white balance. So if you're shooting and you press the left portion of the um, control wheel, you can activate the white balance and change your white balance quickly. Um, and then the next one that I have changed is, let me see, let me get back down in here. The AF tracking sensitivity. Um, again, we talked about this earlier. It's really important, and it's the right section of the control wheel that I have put this on. So if I press right on the control wheel, it brings up that AF tracking sensitivity, and then I can use the control wheel to the right or the left to quickly change that. Again, it's really important to be able to do this without taking your eye from the viewfinder um, and memorizing what all of these buttons are will allow you to do that. So I put the most used features on all of these buttons. And the next one is the bottom portion of this button, the control wheel. I have it set to face, eye, subject, select. So when you actually press this button, it will switch the algorithm that it uses to prioritize the face or the eye. So if I touch it once, I'm on human. If I touch it again, I'm on animal. If I touch it again, I'm on bird. Um, it's a quick and easy way to move through those algorithms. Um, you know, if you wanted to photograph a human, there we go. If a goat came into my frame, I could put it back onto um, animal really quickly and then grab the goat that came in. And then if I press down again, I'm back at bird. So it just cycles through all three of those just with a touch of a button. Again, I keep repeating this, but it's really important. It's so that you don't have to take your eye from the viewfinder. You don't want to miss what's happening out there by digging into a menu. So we put all of these things on these custom buttons. Um, and I believe that's all for that. So we're gonna go to the top portion of the camera. I don't make any changes to the dials, the aperture slash shutter speed. They're a default setting for me, um, but I do add APS-C um, crop mode to the custom button or C1 button on the top. So if I wanted to shoot in crop mode, all I do is I press that uh, C1 button on the top and this little icon will appear in the bottom right screen there, it's tiny, but that means that we're in crop mode. I press it again and we're back into full frame mode. So we're gonna go back into the same section and this one is really important. The C2 button, custom two, is gonna allow us to switch our focus area quickly. So if you remember, we have four focus areas selected this is how we would cycle through them with the C2 button. Um, so you press the C2 button and it will move from one area, focus area, so focus area tracking small to tracking large, and then to the next one in line, which is zone, and then to the next one in line, which would be zone tracking. So again, you just press this C2 button quickly to cycle through and to get the one that you want. It takes a millisecond to set it and to get it where you want. And again, it's all, I keep repeating myself, but this is important. It's about not taking your eye from the viewfinder. It's, um, it's mapping all these buttons to these features that you use all of the time and then memorizing what they actually do is extremely important. Um, I think we have one more setting here down in uh, the lens barrel. The lens barrel is basically a repeat of the AEL button. It's gonna be a manual focus, uh, AF, MF, selector hold so that we can be in manual focus the same way the AEL button works. All right, we're almost done with the uh, custom stuff. We're actually done with the custom key mapping, but we still have to make a few changes in the customizing menu. And the next one is gonna be this different set for stills slash movies. It allows us to have a different set of settings for stills and movies. And it says this here, you can set different settings for still image mode and movie mode in the next screen. The setting set for a check mark is independent. So what I change is I want to have an independent aperture, an independent shutter speed, and an independent ISO when I'm shooting stills and movies. That way they can be different in each mode. You typically don't have the same settings when you're shooting stills and video. Video is a completely different animal and all of your settings such as shutter speed, aperture, and ISO would be different than when you were shooting stills. On the earlier Sony cameras, if you were shooting stills when you went to video mode, 
all of your settings from stills were copied over to video, video mode and you'd have to make changes really quickly. With this camera, you can set it up to shoot different settings in different modes. The only thing that I like to change is the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. So if I'm shooting video, I can set all my shutter speed, my aperture, and my ISO to one setting. And when I go back to stills, it will be different. I can set it to what my still settings would be. And when I go back to video, it remembers what the video settings were prior. And you can just go back and forth without having to worry about making these quick changes um, that can cost you a shot. All right, we're gonna come back into the menu and we're gonna make some more changes here. We're gonna come down here into this disp screen set. This is actually a really powerful feature. And you have two choices here, monitor and finder. Monitor reviews to, uh, refers to the rear screen and finder refers to the EVF. So if you select monitor, you get this screen. And what this is basically saying, each one of these selections is information that you can have overlaid or displayed on top of the screen. So I've chosen no display info for a clean screen, a histogram, a level, and then this last one is monitor off. That's really important. So I'm gonna go ahead and select all of those and move over and hit uh, enter, and it will allow me to have those on the rear screen. Let me show you how this works. But first, while we're here, let's go ahead and make the same changes in the finder, which would be the EVF or the viewfinder. So this is the same. It's gonna show you what information can be displayed on top of the screen in the EVF. So I like no display for a nice clean uh, view, so nothing is obstructing my view. I like the histogram and I like the level. And once I've got all those, I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter and come back out. So this is the rear screen. If I want to cycle through those, I just press up on the control wheel, the upper quadrant. It's labeled DISP, DISP for display. So if I press up on that, look, my um, histogram appears here in the right corner. It's not a very good histogram at the moment because I have a lens cap on and it's black. So it's measuring pretty much no light and saying that this is massively underexposed. So if I want that to go away, I press up and now look, I have my level built into the camera and this, this shot is level. If I press up on the control wheel again, the entire rear screen just shuts off. It's, it's off completely. This helps save battery. And this is how I keep it most of the time. And don't panic. If you need it to come back on, it's really, really simple. If you like, say you want to go into the menu, all you gotta do is press the menu button and the screen jumps to life. When you're done with the menu, you can half press the shutter button and the screen shuts back off. If you want to view images on the rear screen, all you have to do is press the play button down in the bottom corner there and the screen will jump back to life and you can see all of your images and cycle through them. And when you're done, you can half press the shutter button and then that rear screen is again deactivated. This helps save battery. But what if you wanted to actually film or use the rear screen? It's really easy to turn it back on. You just press the disp button, that upper quadrant, one time, and the screen is back on. And again, every time you press that button, it's gonna cycle through those overlays. So there's the histogram, there's a level, the screen is off. If I want it back on, I press up again. And again, there's my histogram, my level, and then I can turn the screen off. Really powerful and a really cool set of tools to have there. Um, so let's go ahead and go back into the menu because we gotta make some more changes. The record with shutter, I have that set to on. This is for videos. I like to record videos by pressing the shutter button. Um, and that's what that actually does. And then I don't make any changes here to the dial customize. I don't do anything in the touch operation. I do make some changes in the finder monitor. These are more of a personal preference. I have the finder monitor on auto, which will allow it to switch back and forth. And then I like my monitor brightness to be sunny weather. So this is the rear screen. I'm almost always out in the bright weather and I need that screen to be bright. This helps me see it in bright light, but just understand it's not a good indication of exposure because it's a little over overdone. It's like overexposed and a little oversaturated, but it's good for bright sunny conditions. And then this next one, I've met a lot of people who have this wrong. This is very, very, very important. The finder frame rate must be on higher. And let me explain why. The finder frame rate should be high plus because in my experience, any other setting introduces just a little bit of lag in the EVF. And if you're not familiar with what that is, that means when you're looking through the EVF, you're actually seeing a delayed version of what's happening in the real world. It's not much, about about 10th of a second, but sometimes if you're filming something or video or taking pictures of something very fast, like diving ospreys or peregrine falcons, that little bit of a lag is enough to throw off the entire thing. 
So put it on high plus, and when you do that, it will be lag free, 100% real time, as far as I can tell. Um, the result is the viewfinder or the the field of view seems to shrink just a little bit in the EVF. It's not all that noticeable, but it, but it is different. But that's how you, I have found to get real time um, with no lag is by changing that to high plus. And there's so many people I've met that have not done that setting. Um, so it's important. Go ahead and do that if you're taking uh, images of fast moving things. All right, we're almost done. We gotta make a couple more changes. Um, I come down here to the display option and the only change I make is this auto review. I have that set to off. I don't want the camera to automatically start to play, uh, displaying images that I've shot. I think that's a waste of battery. So if I wanna see images, I just do it manually. Um, and then in the power setting options, I come over here and I have the auto monitor selected to off. Cause remember we have selected the monitor to be shut off manually with that disc button. So I don't want it to shut off on its own because I control that now. Um, it's really important to be able to control all of these things on the camera. The power save start time, I have that off. You might want to change this to allow the camera to shut down if it's not being used. I just use the actual power rocker on the top. If I'm not using it, I turn it off. I don't want the camera to go to sleep on, uh, on its own in the middle of an important shoot. So I have turned this off. Um, down here in the sound options, you'll see that the audio signals here, it's selected as off, and this is actually grayed out. Um, it's grayed out, and if you wanna see why something is grayed out, sometimes you just click on it and it'll tell you. So this is grayed out because I'm in silent mode, so there's no audio signals, so I don't have an option to change it because I'm in silent mode. And USB, under USB um, power supply, I turn that on and I find that a really handy feature. You can actually power the camera through the USB cable on the side, through a USB-C. You can actually charge it too when you're driving. You can just plug it in and it'll charge the battery in the, uh, in the camera. And believe it or not, that's it. We are done. That's it, you made it to the end. Thank you for watching all the way through. I hope you found this helpful. Share this video if you found it helpful. Tell everybody that uses a Sony camera. Tell everybody that's thinking about using a Sony camera. All of that helps me. Um, don't forget to subscribe. I have a lot of great content coming up. I've got a huge backlog of content that you can spend days, weeks, hours, months maybe watching. Some of the old stuff might not be that good, but um, you can actually watch me grow as a photographer and a videographer and a storyteller. Might be a lot of fun for you. Um, if you have any comments, let me know in the uh, comment section below. And like I said a couple times already in this video, there is a companion guide that you can purchase at my website. It's a great way to support me and what I do. Um, and until next time, I'll see you later.